My sister Amelia was always dealt the worst possible cards in life. And unfortunately, I was always too young to do much for her. I was only 13 when she got knocked up by her boyfriend at 19. Back then, Mom and I thought Tom was just a troublemaker, and that it wasn't fair that Dad disowned her. I actually still think that she needed us more than ever back then, and I resent Dad for everything she went through, but it's too late for that. Tom promised Amelia that they would manage. They would both get more shifts at their respective grocery store and fast food restaurant that they worked at. The three of them would make it with so much love. He absolutely forbade her from getting an abortion. Again, another thing that I couldn't possibly understand, being so young. He changed his mind about loving his kid three months after my nephew was born. Tom left a jobless Amelia and their newborn son, Finn, all on their own. That's when Mom convinced Dad to take Amelia back, at least for a while. I know it's selfish of me to say that, but Finn was a pain in the butt, always screaming and smelling like poop. He was a sickly kid too, and the moment that I started having sleepless nights over my sister's baby was the moment that I decided I would never have kids myself. Dad gave Amelia three months to get back on her feet. She worked her butt off, while Mom and I took turns taking care of Finn. I always felt that there was something wrong with that baby. He was so ugly and unpleasant, and it felt almost menacing to be alone with him. I feel horrible for not loving my nephew, but despite hating being around that strange kid, I gave my best to aid my sister. I didn't want her to leave, and I couldn't understand why she wouldn't just give the baby to Tom, who wanted it so much and move on with her life. Things might have been so much different for our family if she could do as 14-year-old me told her, but then again, a while later we learned that Tom had unexpectedly died a few months after leaving Amelia, overdosed all alone behind the small grocery store that he worked at. By the end of the deadline that Dad had gave her, Amelia managed to find a cheap house on Delaware Street. It was a place in the suburbs that had many empty lots, some of which seemed to formally nestle some houses that burned down. But other than the seemingly ominous coincidence, it was probably a pleasant place to raise a child, full of brand new houses with long, decently manicured patches of grass. Having grown up in a small apartment, I even envied Finn for his luck, and I was too young to find strange that the rent was too cheap for such a nice place. I was the first one to hear about its peculiarity as I helped my sister move her stuff. The neighbor, an older lady that introduced herself as Auntie Rowe, came to say hello and explain to us the only but very important rule that they had. You absolutely cannot whistle when it's dark outside. For good measure, don't ever do it. I nodded. I didn't even know how to whistle anyway. Are you going to live here, kid? No, madam, I'm just helping my sister, I replied. I'll make sure to explain that to her then. Uh, come here, I bake some goods for the new arrivals. Amelia's life ended up getting a lot better. Her neighbors were incredibly nice and they helped her by babysitting Finn. And my nephew's health even seemed to improve. Auntie Ro and the others were always kind. Except when I asked questions about the whistling. It was a rule to strictly follow and that was all. Trying to pry on more than that made them fidgety, evasive and even unfriendly. Eyes clouded with fear. My sister met a nice man at a fast food restaurant that she worked at. And in less than a year, they were planning to get married. His name was William and at least to my young and unseasoned eyes. He seemed to be good to her. 
he even decided to adopt Finn as his son, which was incredibly cool. They barely lasted two years. Amelia and William decided to have a second baby shortly after getting married. A mere two weeks after she gave birth to my second nephew, Noah, William was killed in a nasty car crash. Once again, my sister was a single mother, struck by tragedy and all alone. Mom begged her to come back home, but things were ugly between Amelia and Dad. Besides, the rent on Delaware Street was so cheap, she still could keep the house, and with it, a sliver of her pride and of the happy memories she shared with her husband. Things weren't good between Mom and Dad either, and I had never been a fan of Dad anyway, so it was sort of serendipitous for Mom and I that we decided to live with Amelia for a while and do stuff around the house while she mourned. I was already 16 and working part-time, so I gladly gave all my money to help my sister out a little bit. Unlike how it had been with Finn, I immediately grew fond of Noah. He was such a smart and well-behaved baby, and his presence had the opposite effect of his older sibling. I felt calmer, almost mesmerized by his big brown eyes. Both Finn and Noah looked a lot like Amelia, Chocolate eyes and hair contrasting explosively with fair skin, just like dad. You couldn't even tell the boys had different fathers, since they barely inherited any physical feature from Tom and William. Unlike the four of them, mom and I had slightly darker skin and blue eyes. Things weren't bad for me, except for one thing. When I was in Delaware Street, I could never sleep the whole night. I had restless dreams and the only thing that ever calmed me down was getting up and staring at the static suburbia across the closed tempered glass window. The lazy streetlights. The parked cars slowly getting flecked with dew. The occasional faint movements behind the neighbors at translucent blinds. One of these nights, there was unusual activity in the house in front of ours, where an old man lived alone. Auntie Rowe had told me that this particular neighbor, Mr. Davis, had recently found out to be terminally ill, so I started opening my own window to ask if he needed some help. But I stopped dead on my tracks as soon as I detected what kind of unusual activity he was engaging in. He was whistling. The next morning, when the police asked around if there were any eyewitnesses, I didn't say anything. I was adamant on never telling a soul about what I saw. First, there was a noise, like the steps of a giant or of a god. That part many people could confirm. Because unless you were blessed with being a heavy sleeper, it was impossible not to wake up to this sound. An already familiar harbinger of calamity for most. But you couldn't see anything, of course. There was no source for this sound. That much, everybody on Delaware Street knew. And then came the swarm. Thousands, no millions of unknown little things. Mysterious pieces of blackness and dread. They were like wasps, but each of them was covered in multiple eyes. I swear that I saw many of them staring deeply into my soul as I sat by the window paralyzed with fear, but they didn't attack me because I didn't whistle. It was like an inevitable judgment being passed on whoever couldn't follow the one crucial but simple rule. Never whistle after dark on Delaware Street. The swarm engulfed the house, consuming in a matter of seconds, not only its walls and furniture, but its very substructure and of course, every living thing inside of it. There was no funeral, but the neighbors held a small reunion to tell Mr. Davis's kids, each older than my parents, about some of his last stories. Silly things like gardening and the kind of bread that he had been into. I cried after Auntie Rowe explained that he had given his cat to a teenage neighbor earlier that week, a proof that he had deliberately chosen to break the rule. 
Why did he kill himself? He was so old anyway. I asked Auntie Ro later that day in the kitchen, while the two of us made my sister some oolong tea. Back then, I didn't understand how devastating a condition like this can be to one's soul. Beatrice, let me tell you something. Delaware Street is many things. For people like him, it's a panacea. A place to go in your own terms. Or, if you want to be a pessimist, a place where you can die a difficult, unexplainable, but quick death. Even clean in a way. So, all the empty lots. Yeah, all families that whistled, intentionally or not. The swarm got them. She explained very casually, and then noted how wide my eyes were. Don't worry about telling the police. Everyone thinks that it's BS. You're not the only one who has a habit of watching the empty street, you know. Seven months went by since Mr. Davis's death, and my sister didn't get any better. She just loved William too much. Mom explained to me, It's poisoning her soul. What can we do? Should we get her a new boyfriend? I remember asking. God, I used to be so naive. Dumb, even. Mom and I were pretty much raising Finn and Noah at this point. Amelia was like a machine. Going to work without batting an eye, and then coming home and falling apart until the beginning of her next shift. And then one day, there is a small improvement. She got a generous tip at her work. We thought it was the start of something good. Mom, Beatrice, you've been too, too good. So, I want to ask you something. She put a considerable amount of money in my hand gently closing my fist around it. You two, grab dad for me. I need to make peace with him. He was a piece of crap, but I want to start over. I think he deserves to see his grandkids. So, bring him here to let us talk and go watch a movie. I'm overworking you, so I won't take no for an answer. An ominous thought crossed my mind. But she would never do anything bad with her two sons in the house, right? Right. So mom and I complied. We went and had fun while all the rest of our family was eaten alive in a few seconds. The neighbors heard the whistling. There was no doubt that it was Amelia's. Here's the note that I found between the bills that she handed me. Dear... Beatrice and Mom, Dad is not a being that logic can explain, and I am not too. It's unfortunate that I ended up having two boys, each from a different father. When you look at Finn and Noah's angelic faces, it's hard to believe, but they cannibalized their dad's souls, which would have happened to Dad if I was a boy too. Since I'm not... I'm just a carrier of this terrible curse, and the boys will slowly feed on me until they are old enough to hunt by themselves, just like Dad did to his parents. But the swarm of Delaware Street, it's absolute. It's a hope to end this accursed bloodline. Please don't worry too much about yourself. Beatrice, you vowed not to have children, remember? So you'll be fine. Especially because you don't look a lot like Dad, so his blood is weaker on you. Please rest assured that I went peacefully and out on my own will. It's been 15 years since I've lost my sister, nephews, and father at once. Without the first three of them, Mom lost her will to live and faded fast. On her last moments, she reassured me that I shouldn't worry, because she wasn't even sure if I was Dad's daughter. For years, I've been looking for a doctor that will agree to sterilize me, but I'm broke and I can't go too far, and I'm stuck in a state that has yet to be introduced to the concept of reproductive rights. And then what I feared the most happened. My boyfriend... The only man that I trusted 
poked holes in his condoms, and I found out to be pregnant. Now I'm on a lonely, urgent journey to handle it the best way possible. If I don't succeed, I know that Auntie Rose's house has been empty since she passed a few years ago, so I'll have a place to go, quickly and on my terms. And I'm not going alone.